hey guys, we recorded this episode of Booked Up before the arrest and unsealed federal grand jury indictment this week of the tousle-headed billionaire crypto man baby, Samuel Bankman Freed. But don't worry, in addition to SBF, we talk about a lot of other criminals. I mean, alleged and actual felons. Welcome back to Booked Up. This is Jen Taub, and today I'm speaking with my old friend, New York Times dealbook columnist and author, Joe Nocera. The last time I saw Joe was in Northampton, Massachusetts at Jake's Diner when we spoke about derivatives. Today, he is going to talk with me about his acclaimed podcast, The Shrink Next Door, and the Apple TV series based on it, starring Will Ferrell and Paul Rudd. And finally, he's going to tell me what the hell is going on with that uncombed crypto crash bro, Sam Bankman-Fried, and the collapse of FTX. Let's dive right in. Hi, Joe. You 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 look so youthful, Joe. Is it the baseball cap or? Uh, maybe my second grandchild. Yeah. Three months ago, I had zero grandchildren, and now I have two. Oh, mazel tov. So you need to take the Amtrak right up to Northampton. You know, we have a stop right here now. I, you know, I saw that you posted that on Twitter. Th- is that where the restaurant used to be and the, and the, the bar underneath, the, the, the bar in the cave there? Well, the good news is the restaurant, is the depot is still there, as is the tunnel bar. This is above. It's a, you know, covered but outdoor depot where you can just get on the train and there are multiple trains a day. You can get a direct, you can hop on the Vermonter and be in New York City quite quickly. Wow. And if you don't want to catch the Vermonter. I remember many, many, many a Tuesday morning getting up at 530 so I could drive to Springfield, park Mm -hmm. in that awful parking lot, get the 610 or whatever the hell it was. I took... The other day to go down to at a conference in New Haven, like I took a 6 a.m. train. I was in New Haven by 830 and then I went down to New York. But it was great because that train is called the uh, Valley Flyer. So like the Vermonter only goes once a day all the way into the city. But you can hop on a Valley Flyer, get to New Haven, then you can get a Metro North. You know, there's a lot. A Valley Flyer. Wow. It's great. Wonders ever cease. You have to move back. Uh, No. Okay. I like New York. Yeah, I'm staying. I like I'm New York. staying. I'm staying. But you have 150,000 Twitter followers. God damn you. <laughs> I, I thought it was um, 243,000, but well not done. that I'm checking. I yeah. have 23,000 and I can't get above that no matter what I do. Oh, yeah. <sighs> it's probably painful. good because everything is now, you know, scattering to the winds. We're going to become I, like that a is tower true, and of that's, Babel. Right. Bethany and I are going to start a Substack, and you know, Ooh. I need that. I need that place to to show my wares. I need Twitter. Yeah, I need no, something. No, it's true. Well, there's so, lots. So I'm of- I'm super nervous about this. I hate I, can I help hate you. Facebook. I hate Facebook. Well, what about yes. there's there's Post, there's Mastodon. Right, right. I, I just I just signed up to post, so we'll see what that's like. Have you posted on post? Because I can tell people you're there. No, I haven't posted yet. So I, I need a, to post something. So I got to tell you, this is funny. Post is new, but it already has a, a few funny like glitches and memes. You know, um, you know, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman. Yes. So um, he when he joined, he joined post in like a couple like last week. He he just put a post up. It kind of looks a lot like Twitter. He put something up, and it said. Can you retweet this so people know I'm on this doohickey? But he wrote D O H I C K Y. So like everybody did that, and that was in your, <laughs> and so there's so few people on post at this point. There's like twenty five thousand. It was like constantly you were getting the doohickey, you know, meme <laughs> even weeks later. And then people funny. put these pictures um, of like you know, isn't it spelled doohickey? And it, so if you get there yes. and wonder what's going on with that, that's what's going on All over right. there. All right. So. I haven't seen you in a super, super long time. I think the last time I saw you in person might have been um, back in 2005. 
um, up here. Sitting, in, sitting next to each other in a classroom? Well, was I sitting next to you? You saw me. You were in, we were in this classroom at UMass Amherst at the business school. And right. Sheila Bear, who was um, not yet, oh, had she been? She was not quite yet the FDIC chair. She was soon to be. She was kind of on the faculty at the moment at the business school. She had brought in Senator Paul Sarbanes, who, uh, uh, co, you know, co-sponsor of the Sarbanes-Oxley law to kind of reform corporate governance. Um, he was up there and they were talking. And I think I asked some sort of pointed question and you came up to me after and you thought that, what did you say? Did the Boston Globe sent me? Because where had you come from then? <laughs> I think I was at Fortune maybe at the time. Oh, that was 2005. I would have, I would have been a business columnist for the Times. Oh, so the, yeah, you thought the Globe had, had sent me. And I thought that was the biggest compliment ever because <laughs> I consider myself, you know, I do, I'm an academic, I'm a law professor now, but I consider, you know, law to be more of my palette for writing, not mm-hmm. not my vocation, if that, that makes sense. But um, so, I wanna, so, so what have you been doing since then? You had the column for the Times and then you went over- <laughs> Since 2005? <laughs> no, I need to catch up. I mean, I follow you. Okay, I know what you've been doing. But... All right, so what I've been doing, yeah. business columnist for the Times, op-ed columnist for the Times, sports business columnist for the Times. That was kind of uh, me getting kicked off the op-ed page because my boss didn't like, my, didn't like me. Um, moved to Bloomberg because I couldn't figure out how to get into the Trump coverage for the times. And I was feeling very, Before that, uh, though, you wrote, you and Bethany wrote the book, all the devils are here. Yes. About the we wrote all the devils meltdown. are here in 2008 okay. about the financial crisis. That's right. right. Then, um, You're I wrote, Bloomberg, you said. I wrote indentured, um, oh, about right. the NCA, about the NCAA. Right. Uh, and, 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 uh, the, the people who were trying to blow up the NCAA. So like the uh, intersection between sports and business. Yes. Right there. And um and the injustice. I mean it's it's more than just business. It's just it's injustice. It it was a I mean I viewed it as a civil rights issue actually. I still do. Um What in terms of the coaches getting so much money and the players getting nothing? That kind yes. of issue. Yes. And and the black players playing basketball and football subsidizing all the white players on the lacrosse team. Mhm. Doesn't seem right. right. So um Anyway, that was my um, big cause from about 2010 till about 2015 or 16. Uh, then I went to Bloomberg in 2017. I was there for four years. Um, I left there uh, having that's done... What I wanna, that's what I want to stop you, though, because that okay. gets to, to, to what I want to talk about now. Um, people know you probably pretty well for from the very popular podcast, The Shrink Next Door. Mm -hmm. And you started working on that before you got to Bloomberg, right? Can you, because I, I want to, I don't know how to even frame this um, beyond saying that I loved that podcast, but you know how when we were kids and you'd read a book and they'd make a movie out of it and it didn't, it wasn't good. And you would say the book was better than the movie. Yeah. I, and it was rare that the movie would be better than the book. I think your podcast, The Shrink Next Door, is so much better than the TV series or the Netflix series about it. And um, I don't want to give any spoilers about the narrative, but um, I thought it was riveting, and I pe- think people should listen to the podcast. Well, I, 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 don't, I think this is a case when spoilers help, actually. Um, oh, okay. So it's, can it's you a, set it up for us? <clears throat> I mean. It's a story about a crooked shrink is what it is. And the reason the... Um, podcast was more powerful than the TV show, despite the glittering stars like um, Will Ferrell and, 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 and Paul, Paul Rudd, Rudd. Yeah. is that they felt a need not to make all the actors or, or the participants seem awful. That everybody, they wanted to find the, the, the bright side in everybody. And so uh-huh. it was just a less dark it was just less dark, and the power of the podcast came in just how damn dark it was. There's two pieces of the power. The power of the podcast is in how dark it is, but it's also because uh, you take us along on the discovery. Because yes. what's interesting to me about the podcast is the feeling you had that we all have when when you're red flags, when you see when you when you see something and you have this weird sense that something's not quite right with somebody. But right. you don't want to believe the worst because you're not the worst. And as you come to find out and you can't flip and believe, 
like how bad the shrink was, how manipulative he was, right. how much he abused these vulnerable people. To me, you and un- t- using you as a vehicle, because it really happened that way, to kind of uncover that makes it interesting. It's not interesting having an omniscient camera follow this around. Right. You know? I, I, and to me. I guess that's right. I, I don't know how, what I think about that. What I know is that, um, you know, I had this next door neighbor. I at first thought, the psychiatrist the Hamptons, owned right? the house in the Hamptons. I thought the psychiatrist owned the house and the gardener and the guy, the little guy in the green, green outfit was the gardener. And then a year later, it turned out that the shrink was gone and the little guy came over to my house and said, no, I own that house. And, and what's all- weird, though, you should remind us that like when you the reason why you thought the shrink owned the house is because he put his name on the front door. And he hosted right. parties there, and the real owner was like treated like you're saying, like the gardener. Right, and the, and and at the parties, the the owner of the house was basically the servant class. And the shrink had his photo all over that photos of him with celebrities all over the house. It's that's psycho. right. That's right. Going to Paltrow. <laughs> yeah, it was just it was it was insane. It was insane. And, and it's an incredible um, story that you as you're as you're kind of your incredulity comes across, but maybe right. you don't care about that for the movie. Well, what ha- I mean, basically the more I learned, the more incredulous I became. And it turned out that Marty, the patient had, honestly, he had every check. He had every record. He had every invitation. He had everything. Mm-hmm. I don't think Bloomberg would have ever run this if he, if he hadn't had such powerful evidence. Um, and then the, the real discovery for me, I mean, I, I, I reported this in 2011 and 2012. I was two days before this was going to close uh, as on the cover of the New York Times Magazine when it got killed for complicated reasons that I don't really want to get but, into. But, 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 but. This is crazy. So you, it was going to be a cover story and how, how close to publication did they pull it? It's three days. How did they... It, it, it's, it, How do they tell you? No, because I, as a writer, I don't know what I would do if that happened. So w- we get a phone call or a text or what? Yeah, I got a phone call. <laughs> From who? No, like look, 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 we were racing you- to the, we were racing to the finish line. There was lots okay. of, pan- um, basically what happened is, is, is the editor of the New York Times Magazine was in a few, have, was, was about to get fired by the editor of the New York Times, Jill Abramson. Ooh. And I think my story just got, got. It was collateral damage, basically. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I, I, okay. I don't, I can't explain it any more than that. And so, um, that, how quickly did you leave the Times after that? Well, it was wasn't the issue. Um, oh, it wasn't that quick, actually. I was very upset and discouraged. But at the same time, um, strangely enough, that same summer, I had actually, oh, was it the summer before? I had applied to be the editor of the Times magazine when the job came open. And I really wanted it, and I really thought I could do do it well. Mm-hmm. And at the last second, literally, uh, Hugo Lindgren jumped in and got the job, which is, uh-huh. you know, it turned out fine. It was fine. And so I was able to parlay that loss into a spot on the op-ed page. Uh-huh. So once I got on the op-ed page, I wasn't going to quit, no matter how many magazine stories of mine they killed by the way it was the only it was the only one they did kill i did i did a bunch of them so Mm -hmm. so i mean the the thing the thing i'm trying to get at is the the real discovery for me was was once uh, so i knew by 2012 i knew marty's entire story Uh uh-huh but and i knew on the periphery right yeah marty markowitz and i knew on the periphery that there were other people who had been manipulated and taken advantage of by Ike Hirschkoff, the shrink. Mm. But I didn't really know who they were, and I really hadn't done much about getting them in the magazine story. And the great, to me, discovery in the podcast, once the thing was revived and we were turning it into a podcast, was I was able to find at least three women who told stories that were every bit as horrifying as Marty's, and in one case, even more horrifying, because mm-hmm. this woman, because she followed Ike's instructions, lost her, you know, didn't go to her mother's funeral, <gasps> lost uh, oh, lost right. all her relatives, lost oh. touch with all her relatives. Her daughter doesn't speak to her. Her husband divorced her. You know, her, her life was wrecked right. by this. 
in a way that even Mar Marty's life is not wrecked. Marty's had a great decade <laughs> ever since this, <laughs> ever since uh, Ike was exposed. Um, but this woman, you know, it's just been traumatic and terrible. And and that that episode, I honestly think was um, was the most powerful of mm -hmm. all of them. Did she? I, is I, did you just say, or am I also remembering she didn't go to the funeral? Correct. She didn't yeah. say goodbye to her mother when her mother mm. was dying, and she didn't go to the funeral, and she didn't sit shiva, which was the most um, oh. of all of them. That was the one that really alienated her from everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyway, you know, eventually she came to her senses, and um, much to my amazement, she eventually agreed to speak to me. So, mm -hmm. um, do you think that was therapeutic for her to? talk about it with you or was it did it do you think not it at her? the time but yes oh, okay. in retrospect in the time it was very nerve-wracking because she felt ike still had a lot of power and could could damage her that's one of the reasons people were afraid to to talk about him they 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 afraid he would find ways to hurt them because he so, was a big shot in the jewish community and so on and you started developing this in, as a podcast or a story first when you were no 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 when i went to no <laughs> I'm just confused about how first it was it was killed. It first, was first it was a magazine story. So it's like a 35-page magazine story. It's in my it's been in my bottom drawer for five years. Okay. My son Nick, who uh, is an art director for streaming shows when he's not in New Zealand, uh, is the one who called me and said, you know, Dad, this really should be a podcast. That's that's where it belongs. That's its natural habitat. He was so right. So I took it to Bloomberg. And Bloomberg had never done a narrative podcast before, and but they were intrigued, and they were actually having a meeting with Wondery about podcasts, mm, and they gave that's how. Oh. Wondery 50 ideas, and Wondery looked at the 50 ideas and said, we want to do The Shrink. <laughs> and, um, you know, so all of this was just, you know, lucky happenstance, really. Um, and then we had this huge advantage of... of, of you know, Marty was still my next door neighbor. We were still friendly. I knew he would cooperate. I knew his sister would cooperate. So I knew it would work, you know, mm -hmm. before we even started. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, and, 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 and the rest, as they say, is history. 40 million downloads later, the rest is history. Okay, it's not history because we have still more to talk about because, you know, it's, there was some shenanigans, right? It's not quite like the Art Buckwald Hollywood accounting thing, but you had, or do you still have a lawsuit against Bloomberg? Or did that settle? Oh, you can't talk. God. I can't. What? I'm a fucking lawyer. What do you mean? Oh, God. Well, no, it's just like, I thought you were going to say, well, and then, then the Department of Health stepped in and took away Ike's oh. license thanks to your brilliant oh, podcast okay. but instead Remember, it's like are you still suing bloomberg well no no but let me explain why that was my approach i do care about what happened to ike hershkoff and what you did there but this is show is also called booked up so i'm really interested in the writing process and some of our listeners probably would like to know the cautionary tale all right so here's the cautionary tale <laughs> don't don't sue mike bloomberg that's okay. the cautionary tale okay good basically what happened was i felt like i was still owed money after they got rid of me, I couldn't get a straight answer from the lawyer about how, how much and when. And, For selling and, the rights to the... Yes, to the, that yeah. there was still some back-end money left over. Okay. And That's I just couldn't get a straight answer. Was I, was I ever going to get paid? How much was... I just couldn't get a straight answer. So I felt like I had to sue to understand what was going on. Now, it was very expensive to find that out. And then at a certain point... You know, it was obvious that Mike was not. I, I, and then we got a nice story in the Washington Post about it. And I thought that that story would cause them to at least want me to uh, sign an NDA so they'd have to pay me for it. But they didn't. And, you know, <laughs> I think their lawyer told my lawyer at one point, you know, sometimes Mike won't even settle for a five thousand dollar suit. Did you know that? Oy and so okay. it's like, oh, you, know, you know, billionaires later. So let's go back to the good you did. So whatever happened to this crooked shrink, uh, Ike Hershkoff? I don't really know. Um, if I were guessing, I would say he probably still has a practice that even without his license, he certainly has a right to advise people about their, you know, uh, a psychic life. Um I, I suspect he doesn't have any new patients because anytime anybody Googles him, the first thing they see is um, 
all the stories about, uh, you know, the shrink next door. And, um, um, but he has a core group of friends and patients who have been loyal to him thick and thin. And um, I think they're probably still with him. I certainly don't have any, you know, inside, you know, information about him. And um, well, it, what motive I'm trying, you know, when, when I think about your podcast, it wasn't just like this kind of God complex where he just wanted to be revered like a cult figure to his patients. It seemed like he was after their money primarily, or do you know what is, what do you think motivate, voted, motivated him? Because he certainly got his hands on, um, he certainly got his hands on um, Marty's money and several other people's. Is that what it was about or more so? Well, I think it was about knowing the money was there. So, you know, he had Marty will his house to Ike's wife, for instance. Mm -hmm. And he had another woman patient who was quite wealthy will $20 million to his daughters. Mm -hmm. Both have been reversed, obviously, since then. But, um, and I, I, I think that, that he was the kind of person who worried that he'd wake up one day and everything would be gone. And this was his wow. way of, um, of... Like uh, a safety net? Yeah. And the, the, the thing, the, the money thing that he really took advantage of was the so-called foundation that he and yeah. Marty had, where basically Marty would put in 90% of the money and Ike would take 90% of the money out for, you know contributions to his daughter's Jewish school or... And he'd be the mocker around town, right? right? Yeah. And um, uh, what was the other one? Oh, and, and, and the pen dinner. He loved to go to the pen dinner and he loved to invite writers, you know, gay to lease and people like that to the pen dinners. So he'd buy a table and the Yaron Foundation would pay for it. And um, uh, he'd invite writer friends, or not friends, just writer acquaintances. And then, of course, once he had an acquaintance, he would he would send them one of his horrible um, oh, uh, mystery stories, uh, in the hope that they would like it and and want to publish and want to send it to so a publisher. So, have you read? And because I remember Marty was having to type them up or something yeah. for him. Oh, I read have them. Read they're these? they're really really awful. How bad? And, and they're psychic. They're oh. they're. Um, they're psychologically interesting, but they're just, you know, they, and he's always, you know, there's all the women's with big boobs. You know, he actually uses those kind of phrases and. Um, it, wow. And it's so just, it's, his, 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 his id, I guess, whatever you want to call it, is, is on display every moment in these books. Um, so, you know, it's, a, it's interesting given <clears throat> your background covering, covering business, covering, you know, you wrote about the financial crisis. You've certainly seen fraudsters before that you ended up with one right next door to you. Um, and, uh, you know, you mentioned, we were just talking about Mike Bloomberg, the billionaire who won't even settle for $5,000. Um, I, I, I want to ask you about another billionaire. Maybe he's not, uh, he's a thousandaire now. Um, SBF, Sam Bankman Freed. I saw that on Twitter, you had tweeted out that Andrew Ross Sorkin had interviewed Sam. And so I did today watch um, that interview from last week um, and wonder, wonder if you, what your thoughts are about, about crypto or at least this, this uh, crypto bro. Um, okay. So uh, crypto, I have generally avoided thinking about crypto because I think it's built on air and it will collapse and it's just, it, there's no there there and ultimately it will collapse. Um, so I've never really taken it particularly seriously, even though I know that some people have gotten really rich with crypto. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think also that as always, Mark Andreessen will wind up putting a lot of money in his pocket and, um, uh, small investors will wind up losing, uh, whatever they invest in it. It just, just seems inevitable, um. Once the collapse comes, and the collapse absolutely will come, at least with the internet bubble of the early 2000s, you could say, well, yeah, but it's like the automobile industry. There used to be 150, 200 automobile companies, and um, that was a huge bubble, and you know, 95% of them went away, but we wound up with a very powerful and strong automobile industry. You could say the same thing about Amazon, which existed then, and Apple, mm -hmm. and... Um, 
uh, some of the other companies <clears throat> from the early 2000s. But Right, as compared to Pets.com, it was one of the right, ones that right. it didn't last. But compare that to, to crypto, and you sort of say, well, everybody says, well, um, uh, well, even if crypto fails, we still have the blockchain. <laughs> and I got to say, I've never really understood the blockchain, and, but I it's enjoyed... It's just a kind of technology. It's not, a, it's not an asset class. Right. And, 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 but Krugman, <laughs> Krugman actually had a pretty good column the other day where he said, can you tell me again what blockchain is for, <laughs> what good it does, which I enjoyed. But, um, uh, you know, I think... <laughs> because you were at that event, right? Yeah, I was at that. Was. First of all... Um, I, I was very annoyed at all the tweets saying that, you know, the New York Times was in bed with uh, with SBF or whatever his initials are. And I thought it was one of the I, I, the, I thought it was the hardest hitting interview I've ever heard Andrew yes. give in his entire life. I he, was amazed. He actually. was relentless, relentless. Yes. And, and, and Sam would give it's some. It's just that he has a soft. It's just that Andrew asks pointed questions in a polite way that people maybe aren't smart enough to understand what's going on because it was very good. Well, in that particular case, there was no doubt that he was going for the jugular. Yes. And the, what, what I came away from that interview thinking, and we can get into this a little bit more, was, you know, he, SBF is a 12-year-old kid asking his mommy for forgiveness, mm. you know, after he wet his bed. Right. It was really, I, I you know, when I, I it really had that kind of, yeah, you know, I really should have done a better job. Well, no, this isn't <laughs> about... You should have done a better job, you know, when you did the dishes and you broke something. We're talking about an $8 billion hole on your balance sheet and you saying that you're not entirely sure if you unlawfully commingled funds from customers who you said you wouldn't use any of their trading assets to send over to your girlfriend who is running the hedge fund you're also a 90% owner of that you say you know nothing about. Right. I mean, it was insane. He's going to spend a lot of time in the Bahamas. Um, I think they have an extradition treaty. Though. I, I think, think they don't. Him? I think they don't. Oh. And I think that's why he's there. Hmm. Anyway. I can't figure that out. I was trying to research it. He, but he, he got, I, you know, you, you use the word balance sheet. I question whether he even knows what a balance sheet is. What is? I think it's. I think, I think he was somebody who has this a certain raw intelligence, but lacks any kind of sort of common sense or um, business sense. And why did people throw money at him? I I mean, why is it that he was playing a video game when some VC or call was giving him? Money. That's my favorite part of the story so far. I must oh, so say. tell tell that because I I just I need to hear the details. I only well, I don't know. you know I don't know much more than what that you know, but but it's uh, the VC's in there and they're trying to interview him. They got two people. One one is actually talking to the VC and he's just playing a video game in his shorts and his his his, his sneakers with no socks and his raggedy <laughs> T-shirt, and he's not even looking at the VC. And the VC comes out of the interview and says, "I love this founder." I mean, it's like the Chauncey. It's Chauncey Gardner. I love that. that Chauncey Gardner. That's good. Um, right? Yeah. He's a Chauncey Gardner of crypto. I mean, let me just just the part I loved about Andrew Ross Sorkin's questioning is he, you know, he's trying to figure he's trying to ask some of these these things like, why didn't you have better control so you knew what was going on here or there? And whenever he says whenever there's a question where he doesn't want to answer it, he said, well, I really should have known, but I d- didn't. Right. I just didn't know it was. Go- but yet at the very end, he also says, well, you know, if only someone would let the American customers get their money back, because I know it's completely solvent there. It's like, that's funny. It's selective. You know all of the details it, about what is what is solvent and what isn't, but you just happen not to know about the one this one other area. It's just not, he doesn't it's not know. credible. Yeah. And it was so, what, what I really loved was um, when at the very end, Andrew Ross Sorkin said, so have you been truthful with us today? <laughs> and he, he didn't answer. He's like, um... And he kind of hemmed and hawed and said that he really tried to say what he knew. And then Andrew said, but over, over time, you've, 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 you've lied, right? That was like the last question. And he was like, well, I, he, he also doesn't answer that. He said, I, you know, basically I, when I had to be markety, I was markety. What is. Right. I like that when Andrew, I like that when Andrew asked him uh, uh, what his parents were saying to him. 
Oh, his parents who are law professors at Stanford. Right. And what was his answer to that? Well, part of it was they're telling him to shut up. Well, that's the lawyers <laughs> too, right? He said they're trying to be supportive. <laughs> he's lost one law firm. I think he had like Paul Weiss or some big firm that quit on him. And now he's got... Well, I think what I read was a lawyer he has was was like the same person who maybe the person represent Ghislaine Maxwell. Uh, you know, I right. don't. Yeah, but the other, there was this great. Th- if they you have someone, if you if he really is down to a hundred thousand dollars, he really yeah. can't afford a lawyer. So, well, he claims he's down to a hundred thousand dollars, but it's hard to really believe that, um, honestly. And the other. Um, They've put someone in, I guess the place collapsed about a, a month ago. So in November, they put that guy, John right. Ray the Third, to be the CEO. And, um, you know, this is someone who who knows from what, from whence he speaks. And, he, you know, he, he just said he, that he, in, in all his years, he's never seen such a complete failure of corporate control. Right. Um, you know, and that, uh, I love this, he's, that the Human Resources Department was so disorganized, and I'm quoting the Times, that his team had been unable to prepare a complete list of who worked at the company. And he said corporate funds had been used to buy homes and other personal items for employees and advisors without proper documentation. Employees would make payment requests through a chat portal where supervisors approved disbursements using personalized emojis. That, 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 that's a pretty good one. That is a pretty, <laughs> whoever writes the book, and we kind of know, oh, who, know who it is. We know who it is, Michael Lewis. Now, yeah. my question about Michael Lewis is, did, oh, did yeah. he go in thinking... I'm going to blow this guy out of the water six or seven months ago when he started on this. Or did he go in thinking, hmm, this is interesting. I wonder how, you know. I think, I think, I wonder whether he's in the Bahamas or where he's been. I think Michael Lewis, probably whether someone said this is, you know, this seems weird. And he went there. I mean, it's like a, it's like a weird kind of nerd frat house or something. Michael, this is, this is, um, this is shooting ducks in a barrel for Michael. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just, uh, I think I loved what you said on Twitter about this. Um, I just read that Michael Lewis is writing a book about FTX and has been hanging around with SBF. Sometimes you get good, sometimes you're good, and sometimes you're lucky. And in Michael's case, sometimes you're both. Yeah. Um, Oh, by the way, Joe, what is your Twitter handle? Um, It's opinion underscore Joe. Opinion underscore Joe. Yeah. Cool. Opinion Everyone Joe. should follow him. He's he's very snarky and smart. Um, you're also you mentioned um, uh, Bethany McLean, who folks might as your co-author, mm-hmm. previous and working on something with her now. Folks might know her from the movie Enron, the smartest guys in the room, right? And, and she, she, she also a- co-authored the that book, right, about Enron. Yes, yeah, she co- she co-authored Smartest Guys in the Room with Peter Elkind. Uh, yeah, uh, they were both Fortune employees, and I was they were, their, worked for you. I right, was their the boss, time? and I persuaded my bosses to let them do this, which I'm very, very happy we did. Um, and then she did uh, All the Devils Are Here With Me, and now she and I are working on another one together about COVID and the economy. And in between, she's, ri- she's written two uh, excellent small books for Columbia University, one about um, fracking. Oh, right. uh, okay. She was the first person that I know of who said with fracking, at least in terms of the finances, there's no there there. Mm. And then she wrote uh, a book about, um, not, not the Federal Reserve. What was the more recent one? Oh, I'm embarrassed, Bethany. That's all right. I can't remember. Oh, well. I'll find it for the show notes or something. Um, so tell me a little more about this COVID book that you're writing. Are you not, not wanting to talk about it yet? I don't have any problem talking about it. It took us uh, two years to research it, so I'm not really worried about somebody else doing it. Um, or what's your angle, I guess I would say? Uh, our angle is how, how the pandemic showed who this country pr- uh, protects and who it screws. So children are not protected, I'm guessing. Well... Teachers are protected, but school children are not. Um, but that's because they have a union, so they have power. Um, uh, you know, the lockdown class versus the working class. The lockdown class, you know, all had this view that they were being so saintly by staying in their homes. Meanwhile, they're ordering from DoorDash and, and Amazon. And, uh, but also, but it's more than that. It's, it's, you know, we get into the issues of, of, you know, what did we learn about globalization? What did we learn about private equity in nursing homes? What did we learn about 
uh, hospitals and who gets taken care of in a hospital and who doesn't get taken care of in a hospital. And what did we learn about science and um, uh, what happens if you defy the conventional wisdom in science? And now we know, by the way, that the people who defied the conventional wisdom in science were right. They were right. Martin Kaldorf was right. The, who was the, that? The Great Barrington Declaration was correct. Who's, who's that? Uh, Martin Kaldorf is, a, um, is an epidemiologist uh, from Harvard who mm -hmm. was one of the first to say, you know, the elderly die at such a higher rate from anybody under 50 that they're the ones we need to protect. That and was so clear from February, March of, uh, even as we were seeing the numbers in, in, in 2020. Right, surprised. but we didn't act, but we didn't act that, that way. We didn't right. act and that I way. I live right near the soldiers' home, as you know, where there was no. just a calamity of deaths there, which is... So the, the thing that... The, the, the thing that really turned me around on that lockdowns is of all the stuff in the book, and there's a lot, there's a lot about PPE and PPE scams in Vietnam. And, mm -hmm. and there's a lot about the Fed um, and, and what it did. Um, but lockdowns became my passion um, because I thought uh, it turns out there was no science behind lockdowns, none whatsoever. There had never been any science behind lockdowns. Everybody just saw China and said, let's do that. Mm -hmm. But in well, it's interesting on the other side of it, everyone I know, I finally just got COVID. Everybody like, got whole, COVID. Everybody right. got COVID. It didn't well, matter. Fortunately, though, fortunately, though, there are now the, you know, there was medicine, Paxlovid, right. which I could take because I have asthma and I'm in good health. So I was OK. Right. Well, yeah. the um, in 2000, this is what really turned me on to this whole question. Mm -hmm. In 2006 a guy named D.A. Henderson, probably the most, the greatest epi epidemiologist in American history, the man who led the, the drive to end smallpox when mm -hmm. he was a young man mm -hmm. and then became the dean of the John, Johns Hopkins uh, School of Public Health, um, now the Bloomberg School of Public Health, I might add. Um, and then he, would, he went in and out of government and bioweapons and bioterrorism was a big concern of his all his life. Anyway, Back in 2006, the, the Bush administration is having their famous fight over how do we create a pandemic plan? This is after the president reads John Barry's book about 1918. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're coalescing around this idea of uh, shelter in place and, and, and closing schools and so on. And D.A. Henderson writes a memo um, uh, co-written by three other people, including Jennifer Nuzzo, by the way, who's a very high profile epidemiologist in this pandemic. And he says, the way to deal with pandemics historically is to protect the most vulnerable and let everybody else go, about, go on about their life because the less panic you induce, the better the society functions. Mm -hmm. And as you watch the pandemic play out, you wound up thinking, oh, yeah, that's right. That's, you know, and yes, are people 40 years old going to die? Yes, they are. But, you know, should we let the society, should we let the entire economy collapse? Uh, you know, I know that there are people, especially liberals, East Coast liberals, who would say, yes, it's more important to save one person, yada, yada, yada. I don't believe that. I believe that the role of politicians which most of them failed, is to balance the risks. The risk of economic calamity versus the risk of death. And, and to find a middle ground that tries to, you know, minimize the harm each of those can cause. And where was, though, why didn't they do that, do you think? Because they were following the science. <laughs> because... They were, they were cowed, well, several reasons. Number one, anything Donald Trump said, you know, uh, the, the establishment was against. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if Fauci said we should all lock, lock down and Trump said we shouldn't, we're obviously going to lock down. Um, the, the, the second, I mean, the second reason is it just, it became this um, war of ideology. It became a war of ideology, 
Instead of science. Instead of science. So the blue states all said, we got to lock down. That's how we're going to do it. That's how we're going to fix things. And the red states said, we're not going to lock down. And honestly, if you compare Andrew Cuomo's record on COVID with Ron DeSantis's, it's no comparison. It's no comparison, in my humble in terms opinion. Of, and terms I'm of not deaths. a Ron DeSantis apologist or fan mm-hmm. or anything. I think that his COVID uh, success has actually turned his head and made him think, oh, I can be president. And that's when he became this uber asshole um, mm-hmm. with all this crazy shit that he did with uh, uh, immigrants in, 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 and in Martha's Vineyard. School books and things. Yeah. So this is going to be a very provocative book. Are you afraid that you're going to be canceled by writing it? No. <laughs> Are you kidding? If you spend five years on the New York Times op-ed page and you don't have a thick skin, you, you know, you, you might as well shoot yourself. Speaking of, of that, I, what do you, why do you think it is that there is, is it Twitter that does this? That there seems to be sometimes so much personal animosity towards certain, not just op-ed writers, but actually news reporters. Like I feel like um, Maggie Haberman gets, it may be misogyny, but she gets so much, so many personal attacks that I can't even tweet out, retweet something of hers without getting just all this filth coming back at me. Well, Do number you, one, what? number one, you yes. shouldn't let that stop you. Number two, th- there's two reasons Maggie gets the, all that crap. The, the first yeah. reason, the benign reason is that they don't understand the role of journalism. They assume that the role of the New York Times is, is to tell them what they already believe. Uh, and that, uh, that anybody who gets an interview with Trump is therefore, you know, in bed with Trump or playing games or access, yada, 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 yada. It's all bullshit. You know, Maggie is a fantastic reporter. And all these people who are condemning her, you know what it reminds me of? Did you ever mm. see the movie, um, the, the, new, the movie about the New York Times that David Carr was like the big star in? I read a piece about his, about his life. He was, he, didn't he recently die? Yeah, a couple of years ago, more than and a couple of years ago. And he got overcome an addiction. Yeah. He'd written about his own. But, but here's life. the thing. I don't know the, I don't, he, yeah. was the, he was, he became the Times' media columnist, and he was a true believer okay. in the New York Times. And so he's on a panel with um, Michael, the most awful man in journalism, um, who wrote the, Michael Wolf. Yeah. He's on a panel with Michael Wolf. And Michael Wolf has started something called Newser at that point, which is a, an, an aggregated news site that he claims is going to wipe out the New York Times. Right. And so David Carr takes, um, a, takes a, a prints out a, a, a thing about Newser, a Newser, you know, release or something. And he cuts out <laughs> every story that's not based on a New York Times story. And he puts it up to the audience. And so the thing is just full of holes because the entire thing, <laughs> the entire thing relies on the New York Times. Because they're actually the people doing the report. Right. And that's and how I feel are, about yeah. Maggie. You know, so much of what we know about Donald Trump comes from her reporting. Yeah. Her and Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony. Yeah. Those two. Well, Maggie, <laughs> you know, but Maggie is a journalist. But yeah. Uh, yeah. And so and, and so. All these people, every time she writes a story that involves picking up the phone and talking to Trump, they all go, they all go bonkers. And mm-hmm. they all assume that the whole thing with the book and that she was, so, quote, supposedly hiding information, saving it for her book. They don't understand how people write books. It's, you go back to the source afterwards and you question them for the book and you're writing the book at that point. And you're not right. working and for the newspaper. It's clear to me, looking at the book, that it wasn't that she new, you know, life, you know, a narrative has a timeline. And if you say something happened January 1st, 2018, it doesn't mean that you knew it. Exactly. On January 1st, 2018. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, 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 I, right. and that seems pretty basic to me to understand that, but it's not. I mean, I don't know years. what conservative Twitter is like. I, I, I you know, I, I obviously follow some conservatives and um, some alt-right people, but mostly people like you, you and me. Alt right people on Twitter. What are they? Michael saying? Cernovic and a few people like oh, that. Oh gosh, just, I think I blocked him. Maybe no, I see. I don't block because I want to know what they say. 
But to me, uh-huh. you know, you and I live in the world of liberal Twitter and 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 prog- even worse, progressive Twitter. And, you know, progressive Twitter thinks that anybody who doesn't think like them is bad, is a bad person and is deserving of scorn and ridicule. And Twitter uh, encourages that for reasons I don't really understand. Um, because engagement, the longer you can keep people on the site fighting, the better. I guess, I guess. I, I've stopped I mean, fighting. I mean, as a moral good. I mean, right. as a... As a as a metric. No, I had a troll, and one of the reasons, you know, I got in trouble at Bloomberg was because I kept responding to this troll, and I shouldn't have. And now I know better. And now, when he dances on my grave, which he still does from time to time, I just try to, I just ignore it. But I don't block him because I want to know. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think I started blocking people so they wouldn't live in my head, and also I think getting, you know, veiled or getting actual death threats is the kind of thing that makes you think that maybe you should block people so that they can't see what you're saying so they don't become <laughs> tempted to send you. I mean, I don't know if right. you've gotten an email like that from people. No, I don't. I'm a guy. Yeah. That mostly yeah. happens to women. I will mm-hmm. say this. I find Twitter, despite everything, to be incredibly valuable. Mm-hmm. Partly it's, it's, because it's, it gives me, it, 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 you know, whether people are on my side or the other side, I, 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 I read things and learn things that I would never have thought about before. And also mm-hmm. as a device to uh, put articles in front of you that you would have not otherwise seen. You know, I subscribe to The Atlantic, but almost everything I read in The Atlantic, I pull off Twitter, for instance. It's, right. It's a, it's a wonderful cur- curation device. I and the one too. thing I really like p- about Post News is that ha- it has this... Um, uh, feature that allows you to uh, access individual articles for, yes, for a small amount for of a money, small amount yeah. of money, and I, I really wish Twitter did that. I think it's I, I think that's what should have happened many years ago. I hate having to uh, um, you know subscribe you subscribe to a yeah. pay, newspaper every time I really need to read an article. Mm-hmm. No, it'd be it would be good for 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 newspapers as well. I think that people would want to. And then if you find yourself constantly paying for each individual article, at some point you say, "Oh, maybe I yeah, should get a subscription." Exactly. So I don't have. I to. agree. Um, well, I'm glad we solved um, solved the problem of how to fix Twitter by making people pay for articles. And I'm still going to block the trolls, Joe. Uh, I think I need to do go that. Go for it. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for joining me today. I wish you well. On the new book, I look forward. I look forward to reading it. Thank and, you. Um, and uh, congratulations on what did you say it was? Twenty million, twenty nine million downloads. What forty million. Let's get real here. Oh, 40 million downloads. A, a girl can dream. That's amazing, <laughs> Joe. You just need to live. You just need to move next door to a bad guy. Now that's that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Um, that reminds me of. Uh, I know we we're going to close, but um, Joe McGinnis. Did you ever meet him? You know, the guy who wrote the book about the Green Beret, Fatal Vision. Yes, I do know. And him. then Janet Malcolm wrote a book about him claiming that he, um, what was it, that she, he felt that he misled the Green Beret when he did the story. He did mislead the Green Beret, Jeffrey McDonald. Well, there was McDonald. a whole lawsuit. I once had, um, Jeffrey McDonald, I once had lunch with, uh, with, um, with Joe McGinnis. Um, and, you know, he had moved next door to Sarah Palin at one point to try to write a book about oh, her. Oh, right. The, <laughs> you know, uh, Joe's son, Joe McGinnis Jr., is writing a book about his father. Uh, what? That I'm, wow. Where does he live? That does, I'm really looking forward to. I don't know. I found, was, all, I found out it's all on Twitter. I found this all about, all about this on Twitter. And he is now, I di- had, he's disappeared from Twitter. Interesting. And I had, it was like I had lunch with him. Sometime like in the spring of like 2012 or something like that um, in Northampton. It was a weird day because it was like snowing. I'm not sure why he was living in Northampton. I think he was covering some trial. Um, Anyway, he was a character. (laughs) Yeah, to say the least. Um, That I loved Janet Malcolm's book about him. Of course, I love Janet Malcolm's book about anything. But she also wrote, yeah, what, what was the name of that? Was it in the Freud archives? Was yes, the name of that what book? a great book that is. But the yeah. thing about the McGinnis book, uh, the thing about the McDonald book is that she never yeah. sort of noticed is that, you know, what those two guys really had was a contract dispute. Yeah. Because they had a written contract. 
which mm-hmm. McDonald felt McGinnis had violated by betraying him in the book. There was a whole other, speaking of lawsuits, what Joe told me is he was, I guess his publisher didn't want to defend him in the litigation. There was a whole other piece to it, Ugh. which made me very nervous, like I needed to buy special insurance before I wrote a book. Uh, anyway. You got to. Anyway. Uh, you you, gotta you don't love lo- you don't love litigation as much as I do, I guess. Well, uh, it. <laughs> it, it hasn't worked for me very well, I would yeah. say. I've litigated twice and both times have turned out not so great. I've litigated twice, once at the Supreme Court when I worked on a, a pro bono brief and we won that case. And the other time in traffic court, I got out of a speeding ticket. So I've, I've, I've lived. Oh, I've lived that's nice. So I've only, I've, I've only sued Mike Bloomberg and Boone Pickens. You, you sued T. Boone Pickens? I did. Why? I was his ghostwriter and he fired me halfway through the project and contractually um, he owed me a whole bunch of money and uh-huh. he wasn't going to pay it. So I sued him. And then we settled for like 30 cents on the dollar. So it's, <laughs> you like to sue billionaires. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then Boone and I didn't speak for 20 years and then we became like really close at the end of his life. What a story. He was a big takeover artist. We always read about him. And when I used to teach business organizations, um, yep. his, his, uh, his yep. life in the 80s. Well, anyway, I could talk to you forever, but um, we do have to say goodbye. So All right. it's been this great, was super fun. Great talking. Thank you. Thank you. And um, let's, let's do it again when the book comes out. Wow. We covered a lot of ground and there are still so many more things that I could have asked Joe I was stunned into a little bit of silence as he was talking about the book he is researching and writing with Bethany McLean. In some ways, I do agree with him that mistakes were made and all of us might have handled the pandemic differently in retrospect. But I do have to say, as a law school professor and huge champion of teachers, teachers unions, and unions in general. I don't always like, in fact, I kind of detest when we pit teachers unions against students as a way to um, protect kids. Every teacher that I know cares about kids. And if anything, if anything, they need our support right now more than ever. It's not the teacher's fault that this pandemic came or that resources are short. Um, And I think that it does concern me. And if I'd had my wits together, I might have pushed back a little bit about that. Um, As for the other part of what he was talking about, I think we do need to have an absolutely open mind when we start to dissect um, and look back on how we handled this pandemic. And I welcome um, brave journalists like like Joe um, Nocera and Bethany McLean to take a look at this. Um, One thing I think I wish I also had made a bigger deal about is how important important Joe was as an editor um, when when Bethany and her co-author Peter Elkin were taking time off from Fortune magazine so they could write the book that they did about Enron. What you might remember is that Enron was the large oil and gas uh, conglomerate based in Texas that had a major bankruptcy and um, that until uh, he, until his bankruptcy filing, a lot of the credit rating agencies were saying it was doing perfectly fine. It was Bethany who wrote a cover story for um, Fortune magazine, just posing the question, how does Enron make its money? And it was um, around the time when, when Enron collapsed that people started to ask all kinds of questions about off-balance sheet, off-balance sheet entities. And that was... Um, another factor, these off-balance sheet entities and derivatives that did lead to the global financial meltdown of 2008. Um, That's why um, 
why uh, I had mentioned at the outset that when Joe and I first had breakfast together many, many years ago, back in um, 2005, that he was talking to me about derivatives because I had just worked at Fidelity Investments and he wanted to know if I thought any off, any derivatives or off balance sheet entities might pose a systemic risk to the financial system. He was way ahead of the curve. And so when he, um, when he talks about topics that maybe some of us um, might have a different view on or haven't thought about, I always, I always like to listen. Um, so uh, if you have any further questions for Joe about his new book, um, or if you have any questions about how to, um, how to be very careful um, before you sign your rights over with a podcast, maybe I should I should find, I should look into this myself. Um, You know, he is a cautionary tale. So I encourage you to send any questions you have for me or for Joe to me at P.O. Box 147, Northampton, Massachusetts, 01061. Or you can email me at bookedup at politicon.com.